it's Ben. He listens to your podcast. No, really? He's like, you'll be the youngest one that's ever been on it. He's right. Man, you want to nerd out on snowboarding, you should talk to him sometime. Really? I think that's who you're confusing me with. with he's Laurent's best friend. Growing up, they grew up together. And we dated back in the day. You know what? I didn't know anything about you and Laurent. Like, okay. I, I think I met the both of you at a movie premiere. And then we went out to the Patricia, like to Pat's Pub after. Oh, in Vancouver. Yeah, in Vancouver. Those Rome days. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I have a picture of him. He's grabbing my face and he's kissing me on the cheek like this big kiss. Because I said I said on the walkover, you're my favorite snowboarder from his part the year before. Because he's he so means. fun to watch. Yeah, he is. Like, that's the thing for me in snowboarding. Like, some people you see ride and you go, they're fucking so styly. I wish... Because I got, like, pickle butt style that I have to fight it's against. pickle butt. It's like... Oh, you know, yeah. when you see someone like that, and you're like, oh, wow, that's bad style. Poor yes. that guy. <laughs> it's me. So, and I know that I have it. Most times people don't know that they have it. But, someone um, should tell that guy. Yeah, someone should tell him. But I forget where I was. What was I talking about? Support for this episode of F and Rag comes from Wired Snowboards, Dekine Outerwear, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C. Stay tuned after the show for details on how to win a Wired Board, how cool the gear I got from Dekine is, and a special announcement about prizes for our listeners, thanks to Tribute. Also, if you're from Vancouver and you're listening to this before November 24th, make sure you come to Fortune Sound Club this Friday at 9 p.m. to watch Vancouver's premiere of Jess Kamira's The Uninvited, plus Dysfunctional Family, a film by Dinos Will Die, and Sandwich 69, a video from Sam in Arms. His style is perfect. Yeah, for me, there was something just really aggressive about his style. That, Or not aggressive, but just like you could tell in his body language that he like knew exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. And um, it was weird. The years, I think um, he started tripping at some point and didn't believe in himself anymore. And I mean, maybe this is like too personal to get into, but like I kind of watched that part of his style go out of him like he and ben was out filming with him those like the last when they filmed deja vu and encore or whatever recently and he just didn't believe he could do anything and it's crazy because when he did do it it was amazing it was the same but he just like he got caught in up i think in thinking that like all these other guys were better than him when it's crazy what your mind can do it can um completely convince you that there's that you can't even like take a step properly when it's still it's still in you you know or i don't know he just like lost faith he stopped snowboarding he stopped snowboarding yeah so i didn't but he he i remember um and i mean ben is his is his was his best friend growing up like he knew him more than anyone did and he always like when i was started tripping out in the same way a few years ago he would always say to me like don't do a Laurent like don't take yourself out of wait till you get kicked out don't kick yourself out because you assume it's coming you know and then yeah yeah do you edit these things I try not to like it's nice to have like a a full conversation it's actually not nice to edit is what it comes down to because when you start editing then it's just where do you stop you just keep chopping out you know so um I try not to uh, but let's start at the beginning and then we'll get to that part. So you started snowboarding. Did you say, I, I don't know when you started snowboarding. Not like 98, I got a board. It seems so late. Thought it sucked. And then 99, I did it, realized you could do tricks and became obsessed with it. Like it went from zero to a hundred in a second because the first the whole first season I um couldn't turn toe side like I was just doing the height the falling leaf I hated it I just thought it was so dumb like I'm so much slower on this thing and because I grew up skiing um and I just felt like I was so slow and just couldn't figure it out and it just pissed me off my board was way too big for me my equipment like my bindings would pop off in the middle of a run and like my board would fly down the hill this was like after you like not during the time where you were supposed to have a leash um 
but yeah, I went, I had, you were talking about like, uh, your first board and I thought you might like this. My first board was a Noah Selaznick 156. I do like that. But it was so, fu- when did that board came out? The one with the skate trucks on the bottom? What year did that come out? Do you oh, know? Oh, wow. That's, uh, 1994. Okay. So it was already like five years old. Yeah. And the worst, those bindings that have like ankle, like an ankle strap and then like a shin strap. Anyways, none of the binding, none of the parts on the bindings work. I just hated it. I thought it sucked, and um, I sucked. <laughs> and then when I figured out that you could do tricks, that was the point. Then everything changed. So, what board do you get after that? Did you get a more current board? My mom, um, I think, went to the shop where we used to like get skis all the time and like talk to the guy, and he. So that was a 156, and she got me like a Burton one, maybe it was a 140, and mm-hmm. I, and then, yeah, maybe that, I, you know, I never really gave credit to switching the equipment, and now I'm just thinking, oh, maybe it was that. <laughs> so I got on, and it had, uh, the, the board had real bindings on it that worked, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, because that's late in stuff, like 98, 99, there's good equipment out there yeah ride bindings burton bindings they all were like what they are now really totally (laughs) that's amazing do you remember what board it was what it was a shannon dunn oh awesome element rad it's called the element and it was a the graphic was it was kind of pinky so i wasn't that stoked but i was just like it's a real snowboard holy shit Mm -hmm. and um man i should give my mom more credit thanks mom (laughs) Yeah, you know what? That is a recurring theme in the show. Like, parents have a big, play a a really big role in most people's career, either by encouraging them or by not being there. You know, some people are like, I was able to go do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. So that works for them. And other people are like, my dad drove me all over the Pacific Northwest to go to these contests. Yeah, I think when I was growing up during my like teen years or whatever and this probably has to do with the fact that I like voluntarily moved out of my house when I was 16 and was broke um but I felt like I was one of the like have not kids you know so like looking back to think that my mom would go I remember when like I bought my first skateboard and I had to like work forever to pay her back for it but she like just straight up went out and bought me a snowboard that's pretty sweet um and yeah, that that's sweet. Thanks, mom. That's, Love you, mom. That's really dope. That's super dope. So, um, you're at Sun Peaks at this point, is that Silver Star? Or sorry, Silver Star. I always get those Interior Mountains all mixed up. Which one is Silver Star? What's in Vernon? And does it have like a little village around it? It's kind of up a long road, and then yeah, it's up a long road. There's a little village, and it um, it's got all those houses that are like different colors. Like, in the building code back then, they said every house has to have at least three bright-ass colors on it because they were trying to make it look like a Victorian dollhouse village. And then once we got out of the 90s, I think they were like, oh, God, like, it looks kind of horrendous <laughs> now. But so they've, they've changed it. Like, the colors are more subdued. But it's cool. Like, if you go up onto the Knoll, um, this little neighborhood up there, there's literally, like, pink, orange, and teal colored. Like, all those three colors in one house. That's um, awesome. They do look like little dollhouses. Do you go back there ever? Um, yeah, I go over Christmas. I go. Um, it's. I'll go riding like maybe one day or something there, but um, I think passes are like close to a hundred bucks. Just day ticket prices are insane, and for me, I have a snowmobile and a set of mm-hmm. legs, <laughs> so I'd rather just like go to some other weird zones and walk around and and stuff who were some of the people that came um like pros that came up there that you were hyped on uh for the pros that came up there there was really none no snowboarders it was all um skiers and some really big ski pros came out and i mean i'm i don't think a lot of people that listen to this would necessarily know their names but like i'm talking like the dudes that were winning the x games every year and there was i don't know there was like 10 of them Wow. And they're still, I mean, not all of them are still skiing, but they, that was, I was always like pissed. Like how, how come there's so many 
sick ass skiers that come out of here and no snowboarders because the skiers had their own like it was like the free, silver star freestyle club they had their own like training facility um and we didn't have like a club or anything like that like uh, they stopped building jumps at silver star and in the park but then there was jumps if you like paid to be in this ski club thing so um yeah i mean there was a tom velisette came out of there he was a pro border cross racer yeah, you were talking, you did a bit of border cross in the beginning. Is that... yeah, I did a lot of border cross in the beginning. Yeah. Well, I thought that that was the only way that I was going to be able to... I wanted to be a pro snowboarder, but I knew it wasn't going to be... Like, we didn't really have um, the... F... I don't know, I just like... I don't know if I just wasn't that good at half pipe or... I did half pipe, I did border cross, I did slope style. Back then you did all three because that was like part of the series and you had to get your points to... Rad. To do the series, but I guess I just thought that I had the best shot at border cross. Um, How early into snowboarding are you competing? Um, so, like, I kind of got my board when I was 13. I hated it. 14, decided I liked it. 15, started sending it, <laughs> like, to my head. <laughs> But it turned heads, and people were like, oh. And then I just, and then, wait, because I, like, won some nationals thing or something, and I think I was 16. So, like, competing by 15, I wow. think. Wow. For sure. Oh, so yeah, was... no, no, for sure, because I was, yeah, because it was before I had my license. And did you have to take days off of school and stuff like that, and that was happening? Yeah, I mean, I... uh in grade 10, I was like, I don't know, I'd always look at the kids that were that were in these sick-ass freestyle ski programs, and they, like, didn't really, they were, like, homeschooled, or they had a tutor, and they got to, like, travel, and I just thought, man, if, if I had that, like, this is, I have this huge ambition and determination and work ethic, but if I had that, if I had what they have, um, then there would be no stopping me, and so I tried to kind of create it for myself, but <laughs> went down, ended up going down a weird path that way, because I... In grade 10, I uh, quit school to go do, like, this homeschool thing. But it was more for, like, it, it was it was called Open Door. It was more for, like, I don't know, the pretty ghetto kids in town that had dropped out of school. And, like, the their, uh, what's it called when you're out of jail? And oh, yeah. Your officer, dude? Yeah. Uh, Probation. Oh, probation their probation officer yeah. is like yo you gotta get your ged go to open door so that's kind of who i started hanging out with and then wow but but i was still like uh trying to compete all the time but at the same time i don't know why like looking back why i just tried to make it so hard for myself but i like was determined that i needed to move out of my parents house moved in with my like crackhead boyfriend and worked at wendy's but didn't have a car couldn't afford anything i would have to walk like all the way across town after my wendy's shift and like it was just I think there was a, a period in there where I just tried to like take on too much and be too independent. And in doing that, I kind of stopped snowboarding as much and oh, wow. definitely couldn't afford to go to the competitions. And Is that a recurring theme that happens in your life where you just, you're determined to do it your own way and you maybe make it more difficult for yourself? Yeah, that's your roommate doing, that's probably a, can you pause this thing? Yeah. No, because he'll be doing that for fucking hours. Okay. Yeah. Always <laughs> tinkering. Amazing. Four seconds, I'm like, and then that's it. Yeah, that's all good. Thank you. Thanks. That's that's the bonus of having you in the headphones. Yeah. And can you can you hear like I can hear the the size of the room. Yeah. Because you're like. You're more back here. Like you hear it's more echoey. Okay, should I be more or, close? You should, but you're like okay. afraid of it. When you get there, it sounds really, really good. But, okay. But I could see that you kind of like. Okay, I'll try to stay this there. close. Yeah, that's great. That's perfect. So my question was, do you do you often find yourself in your own way, like you're making it harder for yourself for whatever reason? Yeah, definitely. I think that there's two things there. Mm -hmm. One is that um, I always felt like I had to, like, fight for things. Um, 
but maybe I created that for myself. And then the other thing that I think is like when I look in, I'm like, why do you make things so much harder for yourself than they have to be? It's like for some reason I had it in my mind from when I was really young that um, not that my life was going to be hard, but that there was going to be um, hardships and challenges and I needed to learn how to thrive under difficult circumstances and so I always like put myself in those circumstances uh well I think it's best for us like it's a bonus for us as as the public that consumes snowboard media because I'm I I don't see any struggle in your body of work like when I see your parts or your ads or your um you know like the shots of you in magazines I see somebody who's obviously talented and that talent came from that kind of determination of whether it was real or or just imagined that you had to fight for what you were, you know what I mean? Like that it was going to be hard work. I'm absolutely fascinated that you mentioned at 15, you realized that you had drive and determination. It took me until I was, I don't know, 30 maybe. Most people don't ever get it. I mean, I think I realized that when I was like five or wow. younger. Um, I I don't know where exactly, like I taught myself, I mean, and I, I've heard a lot of people say this though, that they also taught themselves to read when they were really young, but um, I could read a newspaper like perfectly when I was four years old. I taught myself to read when I was three and I just... I thought that, I mean, everyone, I was a competitive gymnast. I was um, playing all the sports, but doing pretty well with them. And I just, everyone in my life kind of thought that I was going to be um, like a doctor or something like that. Like the uh, something typically <laughs> successful. Yeah successful kind of thing they could see that you had that drive so yeah yeah but i mean i I knew i I, like at first i was like i want to be a scientist when i was like a really little kid so i'd like set up a lab in my room or like then i was like i'm gonna be a writer so i would like open a library and literally make like 50 books like out of paper and draw my own drawings and write them all and then like open up a library with like a catalog system and library cards um i just anything i did i like did it all the way and when I found snowboarding, I, yeah, there was really, I mean, there was a couple of rough years that I had in there, um, where it, it kind of drifted out of focus just cause I was, um, dealing with a lot of other shit, but there's never been like a question in my mind that since I found it, that that's the thing that I want to excel at. I mean, there, there's other things that I would like to excel at, but this is a thing that could I could actually excel at. Where do you remember your first, like, kind of, um, you know, success coming from? Like, where where was your first... In snowboarding? In, in snowboarding. Um, was the first contest I ever entered. I was so scared that I almost, like, um, ran away at the top of the course. It was a slope-style contest, and um, it was back when the girls would just, like, flop off the lip kind of and not even like they'd speech check so many times before the thing and I was like oh all you have to do is go fast so I like pinned it from the top and cleared the whole table and like exploded (laughs) but then like someone was like just go a little less fast but it was the first time anyone had seen um a girl clear the tabletop ever I just remember everyone saying that and I was like what all I did was to go straight and I think I realized this is the whole, like, this stuff is so easy compared to the stuff that I was doing in gymnastics and, like, the fear I would have around learning how to do a certain trick and um, figuring out from square one how to wrap my head around it and figure it out. Like, all I have to do is just, like, hack huh. at, like, this thing. And, and it, like, to me, like, the, like, falling, crashing, like, that pain, that wasn't even, like, I wasn't even shook ever, ever. I I blew my rib through my liver once and I was positive that I was fine and I was arguing with everyone to go back and finish my run 
like do my next run because I like oh. needed to win that hundred bucks. And I remember being at the hospital when they were finally like, like they took me down in an ambulance and I was like, I know that I'm fine. You guys are just idiots. And when the doctor came in and was like, yeah, you're bleeding to death internally. Um, I was shocked. And then I was like, whoa, maybe I should check myself because I really, truly, deeply believed that I was fine, that I had just knocked the window to myself. That's got to be scary. Um, yeah, that was scary. I don't really remember. Um, I mean, I was in ICU for a bit. and But it wasn't scary because I wasn't like, I was just like in this mentality that, I don't know if I was, what was scary was like that I had been asked to, uh, I had been invited to girls super park and that to me, that was like the ultimate, I, I was just like a local rider before that. And, uh, I had been asked to go to girls super park that year. And then that injury happened. And when, when I told the doctor in ICU, like, yeah, but I'm going to be good like next month. Right. And he was like, no, you might, you probably will never snowboard again. And that was, I was like, no, like <laughs> that was the, and I mean, I've been told that a lot of times by doctors since, um, why do you think doctors, like, do you think that they know that you're going to do it anyway? And they're like, look, I'm just covering my ass. Or do you think that they're, that the general public out there is just so afraid of life that one bail, like, what well, I'm not going to put myself in that category. <laughs> one of your bails would end somebody's, they would just sit on the couch for the rest of their life. And like, I'm not doing anything. I fell down that one time. I think that the general public, yeah. There is that. Um, I think that, like, there's people out there that are, like, resilient beyond anything we can ever imagine. And that's mm-hmm. when they're put under real things. But, like, uh, when, I don't know, people are people are pussies. And I'm not saying <laughs> that you should just, like, go break yourself and then go make, like, ruin your back and go back anyways and put your life in danger. But um, I just think that we are all way more resilient than anyone gives us credit for and and that the things you're able to overcome um i don't like the idea that a doctor could have you know said like no i'm putting my foot down jess you you're not allowed to snowboard anymore i'm contacting your sponsors i'm t- well i didn't have any so off. i couldn't have contacted anyone but <laughs> but um, did you get did you get hurt when you were sponsored you obviously have had oh, yeah. injuries th- at that time yeah um and uh, i mean about uh, I've always had this thing of, like, I will go to um, <laughs> immeasurable lengths to prove someone wrong if they tell me I can't do something. Like, even now, well, yeah. I mean, I don't <laughs> want to sound like a, like a 12-year-old but who's angry, but um, if someone's like, yeah, I just think you should think about, you know, retiring or whatever. Like, this is going to last forever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, motherfucker, I'll, like... I'm, I'm going to be the one, you know, and, and I remember someone told me that girls, uh, there isn't really a place for them to film video parts. Not that like they shouldn't, but that there just isn't such thing as a girl who's a professional snowboarder who films video parts. That was before I filmed my first part. And I thank that person because, um, that really lit a fire under my ass. To cool. The, yeah. Yeah. We all do then. Cause yeah. what was your first, what do you consider your first video part? Uh, that was the think, think part. And when that came out, um, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. To me, it was just whatever. I actually, after I watched the preview of it, I like left crying because I was like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. That was my big shot and I just blew it. And, and it's boring and no, and people are just going to think, oh, what what another girl part, you know? And then when it came out like that year, when the awards nominations got announced, um, I was up for women's writer of the year women's uh video part of the year women's reader's choice and then i was also nominated for men's rookie of the year and men's standout performance of the year so and to me that like i don't know i was just tripping so hard back then i never even like took the time to enjoy any moment of that i was just um basically like panicked i felt panicked for like the next couple years even being like whoa people think that I'm good and I'm not actually good. So I got to like go extra, you know, imposter syndrome. Yeah. You hear about that a lot in, in, not just in snowboarding in any, anywhere where people are telling you you're good, but holy shit, you know, you're good now, right? (laughs) Well, I look back at that part and I'm like, wow, that was, that was good. 
Um, Not it just was good. good for, that was it was a it was a paradigm shift. It was something that was happening in in the industry that, and you, I want you to talk about it as much as you can. Like women don't get their due in snowboarding; they haven't from the beginning. You know, like Tina Bassett will tell you herself, "Oh well, back then, pipes were shitty." And, you know, her run was like a nothing. But everybody's run was a nothing by today's standards anyways. Like, at, the snowboard industry has systematically held back women. And we can talk about that now, actually. How the only thing that I can think of that the Olympics have, have given back to the sport of snowboarding is by a, a women's gold medal, meaning the exact same to a country as a men's gold medal, has even the playing field um, for like that top competition spot where um, women's progression has happened at such an alarming rate that it's catching everybody's attention and people are going, wow, women got really good really fast. Well, yeah, that's because we were holding them back for how long has snowboarding been around since the beginning? 30 years, 40 years. Yeah, I think people always bring up the argument of like, oh, yeah, you want equality? Fine, then let's put the women boxers in with the men boxers and see who gets their face fucked in, you know? Like, it's not, that's that's not what it is. It's I, I'm never trying to say that women's snowboarding is at the same level. Like, the girls' tricks that they're doing is at the same level as the guys, but there's like so many reasons for that that people don't take into consideration and it's not just making an excuse like I'm here and I'm living it and I'm like if anyone wants to come to my face and tell me that I'm not that I haven't tried like as hard as humanly possible to push as hard as humanly possible then like bring it on um I not seeing what (sighs) So there, I don't know, it's just, it's hard to explain, but like all these guys have always had all these guys to look to. Um, and this level of snowboarding that like, I mean, even if you look back to the beginning of snowboarding, yeah, like the guys were doing stuff that would be not like the, the style was dope and stuff, but like that would be laughed at today. And mm-hmm. um, back then the progression was like people would see it and then they would think, okay, that's the baseline of like what's good. And then they would progress it from there. And, um, with girls, you just never see them because there wasn't as many. Why was there not as many? Because uh, it just goes back to like, I don't know, girls aren't really encouraged to, um, do some, these days they are more, but they weren't encouraged to like participate in something like that. It was kind of like, Ooh, why would you do that? You know? Um, I I always take it back to, yeah, it's like, okay, you're a human and you're you're a baby when you're a baby and you see um, other humans walking on two feet. So without even like having to be told, eventually you're like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to start trying to walk on two feet or trying to eat with my hands this way or wave at people this way. And that's because you know you're a human and that's like another human that's that's progressed more than you. That's where you're going to end up. So for girls, it's the same thing when you don't see... I don't know, like... There's a process um, that's in... I, I don't I, I don't know the book. I'll put it in there in post. The book's called The Will to Change by Bell Hook. I just listened to a podcast series on um, just the male patriarchy, where it came from, and how deeply ingrained it is. Before kids get to high, to high school, before kids get to school, so before they learn to read, they've already been halved. H A L V E D. So boys are told they can't be emotional. They need to be strong. They can't be sissies. Girls are told they've got to be supportive and loving and motherly. And that halving of genders that occurs during this time where like we learn to walk. When you, when you see babies learning to walk, boys and girls learn at essentially the same time. They're, You can't even tell the difference between a boy and a girl from the outside until puberty, really. But that having process is so deeply ingrained that even parents that don't want to push traditional gender roles on their kids are a part of the problem because they don't know that the problem exists. 
that you don't know. Like the mama's boy idea, like the idea that a mom has to stop parenting her son to keep him, like to make him tough. Yeah. That's not real. That's not a real thing. You, if, if you're a mom and you're out there, be a mother for your son for his whole life. That's the only way we're going to stop this bullshit that's happening, which directly affects snowboarding for the first 20 years. But there was no gender specific gear. I remember the boardroom where I worked. It took until after the year was over to look and go, oh, this women's specific gear is the only part of the sport that is showing growth right now. And then it was like all the companies were like, now we're all about women's stuff because they wanted to grow that market, not because they were about women. That's funny because they're all about women's stuff. But as far as like paying girl and I'm not even talking about paying girls a salary. Right. Um, and we'll get into this more. But Please. after doing this project and kind of like working one on one with these up and coming girls, there isn't even like a like a squirt of piss of a travel budget for them. Like nothing. Mm-hmm. And and it's it's oh, like a horrendous idea that they should even be asking for it. Like it's it's laughable and they they um it's crazy how well, the what's what the resources are, and then it it just is frustrating when people are like, "Well, yeah, girls aren't as good as guys." It's like, and I'm not just trying to have this mentality of like, "Oh, we're so hard done by," you know. I have all these excuses why, but it's like I'm there and I'm living it, and I like was one of the people that tried and even, yeah, just had. I don't know. I just one thing that I wanted to say before. Mm-hmm. That just before I forget, um, that might make people understand a little bit more what I'm talking about, um, is when you're a kid and you're given toys. And I remember this would piss me off when I was a kid. The boys are given like the to- the boys are given superheroes and action figures, and they're like these like yeah these heroes. And it's kind of like well this is what you could be when you grow up. Um, and girls are given, because it's all pretend, right? You're pretending to be an adult in whatever way. And girls are given, like, fake kitchens and dolls and all this stuff that's like, this is what you are you need to get good at, you know? Um, and even the way that people treat little boys, like, they'll, like, wrestle with them and whatever and play rough with them, but, like, you, they don't do that with little girls. So it's like, you grow up your whole life kind of getting all these messages of like who you are what your capabilities are of course when you're given a choice between like um ballet and then something on the fringe like snowboarding there you're not like the girls wouldn't be like oh yeah I'll try this thing where I'm just gonna get pushed to the side anyways and people are gonna laugh at me for trying it like of course there isn't as many people doing it and if there was if there was the same amount and the same like visibility I don't even want to use that word because it's like yeah, but if there was that same visibility, then then the options in people's head for what's possible for them are are just expanded, you know. And and that's why guys' sports have progressed so much more than women's sports have. Um, that's that's the same. Uh, what I was saying on the phone. That's that's the thing that changed my mind about it permanently was that CFL versus NFL. And I'm not a sports guy. But the Canadian Football League is laughable compared to the NFL in the States. They're both national football leagues. Like, if you use the logic that women are just not as sporty as dudes, then you'd have to say Canadians aren't as sporty as Americans. But Even though in the CFL there's a bunch of American players too, isn't right. there? Uh, I don't know enough about it, but yeah, probably. The thing is that the CFL is an exact... It just has different resources. It, it's, it's the exact thing that happens when you have less money that's it is that then your guys are less incentivized to train harder hurt themselves and do whatever and then something in my brain snapped and i went oh women could train as hard as guys if they were given the same resources it's not a physicality issue it's a money thing and i really deeply believe that now whereas before i kind of always like when you said the boxer thing before i'd be like yeah put but there are so they many. They want equality. Women. We'll yeah, punch yeah, them in the yeah. face with equality. But if you had a history of women who trained to be boxers, then probably the best boxer in the world would be a woman. I mean, it's a 50 50 toss up at that point because they match them up by weight category. 
And if you've been a woman and you spent your whole life in a gym knowing you could knock the shit out of anyone ever, you would be able to knock the shit out of everybody. Or if you spent your whole life in a gym and all these women that came before you could knock the shit out of anyone. Exactly. You'd be like, you just expect that for yourself instead of just experimenting. Like I felt like sometimes when I was filming stuff, I was experimenting to see like, I didn't know like how far I could push it and definitely went too far sometimes and really (laughs) broke myself off. Um, But I don't know. I just think that people need to, there has to be a precedence and there has to be an incentive. And for girls, there really is no incentive right now. There is in contests, but I mean, as far as like filming video parts and stuff, there is, there are these girls, there's this huge divide between like the girls at the top and the girls that are coming up. Whereas guys, it's kind of like sprinkled evenly from like the top to the bottom. There's like the AMs that are getting a travel budget. There's the AMs that are getting paid that haven't quite turned pro yet. But with girls, there's like everything. There's like the Jamie Anderson at the top who's making the big bucks. And then there's nothing like these, there's nothing for them. And I've, and I've gone to the companies and argued this for them as I was making this movie being like, you guys want female content or you don't even, do you even want female content or do you just see women's sales as a byproduct of men's marketing? Like the men, like the men's marketing stuff happens and then you think it just trickles down and that's how you sell women's product. I don't understand how you guys sell 20%, 20, like even if 20, 20% of your sales, that's like a pretty standard number I'd say for any company right now is that at least 20% of their sales are women's sales. Um, does 20% of the marketing budget go back into women's stuff? No, actually like 2%, maybe 0%. Right. Really? Like the companies I ride for some percent because they have to pay me. But, but besides that, who else, who else, who comes after me? And, um, you know, if they think that they made money off having me, then they should be thinking that they need to like have some kind of system to make more of these people because I'm not, not that like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm the fucking shit. And I, you know, like I make all these money for these companies. That's not what I'm saying, but they'll say stuff to me like, yeah, but it's different with you because you, you know, you came out, you took the world by storm, you did stuff that girls hadn't done before. And it's like, yeah, but you think that was just a fluke? Like you can help develop this and you can help create it, but you guys don't, you just sit there with your, dick in your hand being like oh girl stuff doesn't sell or we don't know how to market it or whatever it is it's just um yeah there's just no system for them to come up and then why like there's so many girls that came up these ams that were so had so much talent and they just quit all of them quit because they were like why are we doing this we're breaking ourselves off we're broke at the end of every season like not just broke but in like huge amounts of credit card debt um we're doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing like we're you know even without the filming resources and stuff, they're somehow still like getting these tricks on film and then just nobody cares and, and they're not getting anything out of it and they know they won't. So they quit. Like the only reason I kept going was cause I was just like, so driven to like prove these people wrong, but most people in their right mind would just go back to school and that's what most people do. So I feel like there's like an all men needed there or something like that's, it's really important that you're saying this. I was going to say now, but like forever, like I can remember, like I said that, like seeing the money people go, oh yeah, we're, we're pushing women's stuff this year. We're going to have four women's pro models. We're going to make a full women's line of yeah, the product, all that stuff. But yeah. what backs it up and what sells that? It's so dumb that they don't, that they don't see it as like, <sighs> okay, here's a real problem with snowboarding too, is that everything is marketing and sales. Like I'm talking with MFM tomorrow and he's doing multi-level marketing. And in, in my core, my soul, I'm like, Oh, that shit sucks. Right. Like Amway or whatever. But I understand like multi-level in a shape of a pyramid. Well, that's what everybody (laughs) says. Right. But that's kind of, is that what that is? A a pyramid and multi-level marketing are similar. Okay. But, a pyramid for me personally, this is what I'm doing. I do all this justification to like, I need to be on Mark's side on this one. Cause I fucking love that guy. Yeah. Yeah. His style is unsurpassed. 
and whatever the fuck he's doing in his life right now that he believes in, I do not think that he's like, I'm going to scam the shit out of a whole bunch of people. He's like, if you're driven, if you're like me, you can make a lot of money at this. Why wouldn't I share it with you? And then people go, but it's a pyramid scheme. And he goes, no, it's not. It's multi-level marketing. And I'm looking at it going, snowboarding's multi-level marketing. You're selling me Capita boards because I see you on them in a fucking film that everything is paid for. All the people that are on that shoot were paid to be there and they're the best at what they do. And it's like, I think I can do that because I see that. And then, so what Mark was saying, he's like, some people buy the books, you know what I mean? But they don't really mean to read them. Some people buy the books and read the books, but then they can't really do the work. Like, I just see that as everything. I thought I could be a pro snowboarder. So I bought the book. I read the book. I tried. But as soon as I met resistance, I gave up. Because I, I'm not... Once you learn what the job is, you're like, oh, fuck. It's, I can't have a family. I got to travel. I got to not just travel in the winter. I got to think snowboarding in the summer. I got to go to New Zealand. I got to keep training. I got to stretch. I got to do yoga. Like, fuck, I'm, take me out of all of these things. I'm ticking the boxes going, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And then I look and I go, oh, and also I have to do that for $100,000 a year. Well, I could work a 40-hour-a-week job where it's like soul-crushing cubicle talking with assholes all day but and get that money and my my risk nothing with my body. I could just eat junk food and be fat and be lazy and drink every day. And not travel or be away from my family. Like, that's the job, right? So, sorry. What a tangent. Oh, I like the tangent. I'm just talking about snowboarding is marketing. And you can't take... Like, in the industry, nobody survives if they want to do it differently. Look at Jason Brown. He started Capita. You think he's happy where Capita is now? I mean, I bet he would be if his fucking account was full of money, but it's not full of money. So he's not happy. And he started this. I remember seeing the spark in his eyes of how excited he was when he got like Star Wars collaborate. He talked to George Lucas himself and said, could I put these images of Star Wars on a snowboard? That would be super rad. And George Lucas was like, yeah, go for it. And he, he it wasn't like a, a cease and desist type situation. He had, like, Star Wars graphics. I wonder how much Burton paid to have that Star Wars collab. It's, like, so for me, the marketing drives certain people out of it that should be there. The creativity, like, there are some guys. Did Jesse Williams do one of your graphics or some of your graphics? Uh, Peter Lyon did, did, did most of them. That's incredible, right? <laughs> like, how fucking amazing is it you get to work with Peter Lyon? Like, that's that's the kind of thing, like, I love shit like that. To me, it's, like, so much more, uh, like, a fuck you to the industry. Even when you're working in the industry, you find these little pockets of people. Like, Blue Montgomery seems like a fucking stand-up dude. And like he a, is. Like a real guy. I'm sorry. I'm just distracted. So when you said, how amazing is it to work with Peter Line? And like, okay, first of all, I love Peter. Yeah. Um, but when I first was about to work with Peter Line, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to meet my hero, you know? And you know, they say like, don't meet your heroes. <laughs> so I met him and he just kept trying to make out with me. And I was like, dude, fuck off. Are you kidding me? You're Peter Line. You can make out with anyone go make out with someone else like i want to talk like i don't ruin yourself to me now so there was like this period where i was just like oh what a creep kind of like and like fuck you man like again because i'm a girl like instead of like having a conversation with me you just want to make out with me like that sucks and so but i think i like i even told him that and now like we're super cool and stuff and i realized that that's not like where he was coming from but it just um it it, it, that was just funny to me when you're like, how amazing was it to work with Peter Lyon? I'm like, well, once we started, like, eventually good. But at first, I was just like, uh, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure he's just, like, used to girls being all over his dick. And he was probably like, what? You don't, like, 
You don't want to make out with me? Let, and... Let's go a little deeper with it, just in a, on a tangent, but like sure. a guess. He said of Forum that instead of being jealous of dudes that were better than him snowboarding, he would put them on the team. So maybe there was a little like, you're so good at snowboarding. You've got a pro model now. I used to, you remember me? I used to have a pro model. I used to have the best pro model. Let's so he's like let's... just trying to get in there with you so that he could be. Uh, on... no, I don't. Or I don't know. or he's just a, he could just. No, be. he's just Peter. <laughs> Peter. Um, I fucking love him. I, I love just him saw too. him like, he came to my premiere at, in nice. Seattle and I was like, wow, dude, that's so cool that you that but you work here. with him all the time. Like he works for you. He he doesn't he does work your... for me. <laughs> but he, he did does. he did my graphics a few times. But that's you could hire anybody. Yeah. Um, and they would work for you. But somehow Peter Line does your graphic. He's not working for you. Uh, well, he I guess he would work for Capita in that regard. Yeah, sure. And he, yeah. And they would put him on. Here you're going to be working for this pro, Jess. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I guess that's yeah. how it went. No, that's true. But he, <laughs> you know what I, um, I I can see his um, creativity in the in the Decine outerwear that he designs. Yeah, he does and, a really good job. And I, I I like the way his mind works. I mean, maybe not in the creepy let's make out kind of way. Or... I mean, he's not he's not like that anymore. <laughs> it was just I just think. Um... Have you had that experience with other people as well? Well, there, I re- for a long time, I wanted to. I was so... And I've talked to other girls that have said the same thing. There was this, like, image of, like, the pro-ho thing mm-hmm. when I was coming up in the, the girls who would, like, suck dick to get somewhere in snowboarding. And I was, just, was so against that and so afraid that someone would try to say that about me that I was trying for the first... I mean, for a long time, maybe I even still do. It was trying to appear like absolutely revolting to guys. Like I would just say stuff that was just, just fucked like (laughs) in interviews or whatever, because I didn't want, um, I wanted to make sure that any success I had, because I, I feel like the girls who came before me, they were ripping snowboarders, but they were also like sexualized to some degree. They were in Maxim magazine or there was always like, let's do the bikini shoot thing. And, I wanted to know inherently that all my success from snowboarding had nothing to do with being a girl and being like sexualized in that way. So like, I think a lot of people were kind of like repulsed by me or my um, antics when I um, first came up. And, and I think that I like looking back, I think that I like subconsciously, maybe even consciously like did that on purpose um, just to make sure, you know, and looking back, it, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like, well, I look at the snowboarding that I was doing and and I'm I'm like, well, yeah, of course people would would back that that this this was kind of a new thing um for a girl to be filming a street snowboard part, you know. And um I'm just I'm just looking at you thinking, "Oh, how hard was it for you to meet people then because as as you're in the industry, and you're, and you're only hanging out really with snowboarders in situations where you're going snowboarding. And you're like, but I'm not going to, <laughs> you know, date or be, you know what I mean? Not going to make myself attractive to snowboarders. So, Oh, yeah. I wanted to be absolutely not attractive to snowboarders. Like if people would comment on on my appearance and stuff. And that, I guess that was why. Like, I mean, Peter was probably just being Peter. But to me, I was like again, like terrified, like, oh my God, it, Peter, if someone even like saw you trying to make out with me and then walked away and was like, yeah, she's making out with Peter Line, then, then yeah, for sure. People are all going to be, I don't know, like you overhear, like you're a girl and you overhear guys talking all the time, especially a girl that hangs out with a bunch of dudes. Um, you kind of get this fear of like, what was that? What they're saying about me behind my back? Like I'm just some like literal piece of meat with a hole in the middle. Like, <laughs> So I, I just... I mean, how how hard was it for me to meet people? I just didn't meet people. I mean, guys, like boyfriends, boyfriends couldn't, that wasn't really an option. Like my boyfriend was snowboarding. I didn't care to meet anyone that was going to like slow me down or try to tell me I needed all my time and all my energy for that. And um, so please tell me, how did you meet Mark? Uh, 
Mark was the exception. Um, I I met him in Revelstoke. I was just I had just bought a sled and I went. Uh, my friend from Silver Star from back in the day, like who would always go visit in Revelstoke, had moved into his house and um, he was just there. And um, it's funny I go from being like yeah, I was like walking around farting so guys wouldn't like me and then I was like and then I fell in love (laughs) um but yeah I when I met Mark I yeah things changed for me and my view of like relationships and love and all that um would you say it was your first love or did you no I mean I I had uh had a lot of relationships before that like uh even from when I was really young and I like, I loved people, but this was like, this was, this one was out of control. Like it was, um, I don't know. It felt like, this just sounds cliche, but it felt like it was kind of from a coming from a different dimension. It was just on a different level. Um, tell me about the, uh, about your first date. Oh, well, can you? I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, as soon as I saw him, I was like, I like walked in the door and he was sitting at the table. That was like the first time I really saw him and was just like, oh, man, this, this guy, this guy is like where it's at. And I had like quit smoking cigs and I, he was, he would go outside for a smoke and he'd be like, you know, I'm not really like he'd play like he wasn't interested at all. And I would just go sit beside him and be like, what's up? Hey, like, while he was outside smoking all the time, not even smoking, just sitting there being like, we should hang out sometime. We should hang out sometime. And he'd, he'd be like, yeah, well, you know, I'm not really looking for a relationship. And I, I just like thought that it was so out of my league and not going to happen that I just was almost making a joke out of it being like, dude, let's come on, let's go on a date. Let's go take me sledding, take me sledding, show me something, you know? So finally he was like, okay, fine. Um, and we went, we went sledding. I mean, it had just snowed a bunch and, and that was one of my first days really sledding so I didn't know what I was doing and um he went to turn my sled around we were just outside this like avi path and um I didn't even this was like right when T-Motion came into sleds so I don't know if you know what that is but it's like a really tippy um really different from the old sleds anyone who grew up riding the old sleds and then jumps on a T-Motion sled like immediately flips it on themselves because it's so tippy so he side through the avi path went to turn around and I thought I heard someone screaming Like, he was out of sight, out of earshot. And then I was like, no. But I was just so freaked out because I was in this environment that I didn't really know. But I just had this feeling that I had to, like, go see what was up around the corner. Even though I was like, no. His sled's here. I don't even know how to start it. I don't know how to ride it. If I get it stuck five feet from here, he's going to come back and and I'm going to blow this first day, you know? (laughs) But for some reason, I just felt really compelled to um, try to start his sled and like go down around the corner. And I did, and somehow made it there without getting stuck. And when I came around the corner, he had flipped, like he had, he was like riding up this pillow thing and hit an air pocket, I guess, because it like the sled flipped over and then the pillow broke off on top of the sled and was sitting on top of the sled upside down. And the, the bars to the sled were on his throat. Like, uh, choking him or whatever suffocating him cutting off his airflow either way i went i ran up and he was like like um and i went i was like holy shit i'm watching this guy die right now and and so i tried to like push the sled off him because it had that big pillow on it even just the sled itself i don't think i could have moved and it just didn't budge like not even kind of and i and he's just like laying there gurgling and i'm thinking um wow, I'm actually going to, like, watch this guy die here. Um, and then somehow I, I, like, went to move it again and got this, like, crazy, like, ba- mom lifting the car off the baby strength and, like, moved it enough for him to, like, get his throat out from under the bars. And um, That's amazing. Yeah, so our, there's on our first date... Yeah, I, there's something more there than just, like, that's a normal thing that would happen. You're sitting there going, hmm... He's he's been a while, but like to to start up someone else's sled, especially when you're kind of new in the backcountry. A hundred percent new, and that whole day I had just been getting five feet and getting stuck, Stuck, and I was already so embarrassed. I was like, "Oh my god, he just 
he's so annoyed with me or like he just thinks I'm a kook or whatever. I just wanted to impress him so bad and I thought that was my chance. And, and Well, it turns um, out your chance out was like yeah. <laughs> baby mama strength lifting a sled off of his throat. And Did he feel like you saved his life? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, he was like, well, you saved my life, so I guess we'll go on a second date. And um, <laughs> to his friends friends after you know i wanted to be like you guys guess what i you know this crazy shit happened but he like kind of played it cool so i was like oh maybe it wasn't that cool but then like talking to his mom and his dad after and like all his friends he actually did tell them like yeah on our first date she saved my life so guess uh guess we can keep it going were you guys pretty much joined at the hip from that moment on or was there a bit of a oh we were joined at like the fucking soul it was it was it was too much. It was because we had to. I had to like leave and go filming, and he had to go up north and go to work. And it was just, um, it was tough being away from each other. I, um, and yeah, I. I mean, I'm just trying to like choose which parts of the story to tell. But um, there was a lot. There was a lot of things that were just crazy. Like a lot of these. Um, moments that or i don't know just aspects to it that were just like sound like it's from a like a fake story you know sound like fiction but it's not so how much of that to tell i don't know well i mean it's your personal story and it and i mean there's some tragedy in there for sure when did at what point does that happen oh right um (laughs) right that part um like, should we skip over all the great, amazing? Yeah, I connected? mean, it was it was great. He taught me how to ride my snowmobile and taught me, got me into all these things. I don't know. He was just like my kind of like, yeah. I just looked up to him so much. Um, he was just like this, this like loose ass cowboy badass who was just good at everything he did, but didn't give a shit to do it for any commercial value and I kind of always felt like I was like oh man I'm kind of a sellout like so I'm like looking at my board like uh Cholo is that his name yeah those guys all came up and and they were like yo who's who ripped this side hill across here like damn um and it was Mark and he was like oh I don't know you know but it was like they were like really impressed with him and they I like I saw them looking at me and looking at my board it had these big like monster stickers and Nike stickers on it and I was just like wanted to sink into the snow being like oh god I'm such a kook right now with my monster helmet and like I mean not that like those are that I feel like those are kooky sponsors to have but just to have like any brand name on your anything there is like everything's so cool and like underground and um yeah so anyways there was this aspect that I kind of felt felt like a sellout around Mark because I was like he's so soulful and like and and whatever but um did he work with you or did he ever talk to you about like that the fact that that imposter syndrome like did he did he, would he work to say like fuck are you kidding me you're like the best snowboarder in the world stop beating up on yourself or was that just something that you kept to yourself um i honestly i think that he like kind of resented the snowboarding thing, not, not the, I mean, he did it at first. I think he, he kind of resented it because it was what, I think he didn't understand it. And it was like always taking me away from him in like these ways that, you know, he could just quit a job and I couldn't just like, I had to do these filming trips and I was on these trips. Um, not that he was like a jealous person, but to someone outside the industry, they don't understand when they're like, okay, you're going on this trip and you're sleeping in hotel rooms with guys. So wait, four guys to a hotel room, two beds in the hotel room. That means you're like sleeping in a bed with these dudes that like he can Google on the internet and see in videos. But really these guys are disgusting. And like, um, (laughs) there's so much like farts and like bad stuff happening in the room that like we, even when we accidentally make eye contact with each other, we're like, you know, like you wake up in the night and your eyes are, you open your eyes and, your homie's like looking at you and you're like, ugh, and he's like, ugh. Like it's not at all like what people might imagine in their mind that it's like 
when girl a girl and a guy is in the same room, things are gonna happen. Like, no, gross. We don't see. We're like literally like less or more like less likely to happen than brothers and sisters. But I think that uh, at first he didn't understand that part of it and what didn't think that I was gonna like do sketchy things. But to him, it was just like there's this whole world going on that he's not a part of and he can't be a part of. And um, I guess so he felt shitty about that in the same way that I would look at him and his friends and be like they're so cool and they don't care and they're not they don't care about sponsors or filming and they're just out there to actually have fun like I'm never out there just to have fun I sure I would love to have fun but if I look at it every time I go out filming that I just want to have fun then I'm then I'm the result is like I felt like I had to be fighting for what we had already won as a girl having actual filming opportunities that if I didn't go out there and literally like grind myself into the ground every single second of that and be the first one up there and the last one to leave every day, then I was going to lose that opportunity for me and the rest of the girls that were going to come after me. So, um, I mean, I completely, again, lost track of the question, but no, you just nailed it. It's like opposites attract. Yeah. That's dope. Like that's the thing that people don't realize or a lot of people don't realize and I didn't realize it when I was young. I I had an inclination that I didn't want to date snowboard people just because my passion is it's not understandable to someone who doesn't snowboard. I mean, not some my wife snowboards and she'll go a few times a year, but she's not checking reports. She doesn't know when the weather system's coming. Do you know what I mean? Like and that's by design because if I did, if I did date someone that that was their life as well, I think there would be that obligation to include them in everything all the time that makes it so now you're not on your time. Do you know what I mean? Totally. Like, which is funny me saying that now after telling you this morning, you know, my wife needs two hours in the morning to get up and I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it is about respecting each other's life. When you share a life with a partner, it's about, you know, you don't want someone making your life uncomfortable and you don't want your actions to make their life uncomfortable. Yeah. It sounds like you guys were perfectly matched. I mean, he shortly, that snowboarding thing was always kind of an issue of contention with us, not contention, but just like there was something there and um, literally a few days before he passed away because, um, spoiler alert, uh, he passed away. Um, we went out to dinner and he like started crying and was like, and I never really even seen him cry. And he like, just like dumped out all this stuff on the table was just like, I mean like, um, in with his words. And he was like, remember when I told you like that, um, whatever the stuff about snowboarding, any reason I ever had a problem with it, it was because I felt like intimidated by you and like your, how powerful you were, um, in trying to like pioneer something and to fight for something that you believed in, even though like you kind of felt people were laughing at you. Um, he's like, that was scary. That was intimidating because yeah, if you had that same balls, to do that then like why would you want to be with me kind of thing um and uh i don't know it was crazy like right before it it just anything that ever was got resolved and i have absolutely like the thing that i feel good about is that i have absolutely no regrets about um our relationship anything that was ever done or said like I never was like oh I wish I never said that to him or I wish I would have told him how I really felt I told him how I really felt every single day you know I like and then like told him again and then and wrote him a letter about it too and sent an email like I <laughs> um there was nothing that um there were no like true regrets there that's the thing um I mean one one thing that I feel good about. After the interview, we talked a little bit more and just told this story about Mark that I'm just going to put right here. There was this kind of divide between me and Mark with with, um, the snowboarding thing that I did that he completely didn't really understand. I mean, he was... uh, um, 
he lost actually I <laughs> lost one of his eyes in a sledding accident but could have been like a freestyle whatever, whatever big mountain freestyle filming video part pro sledder guy right um but um he ended up doing these things that were completely out of character for him because he would never have anything to do with you know any kind of industry event um but he came to the trans world awards one year with me but then he also came to he showed up in hollywood uh for the nike never not premiere and they had like the hollywood walk of fame and they had put, installed these stars with our names on them like giggy and me and <laughs> who like uh jed all the guys that were in the movie and it was just um to have him come there and like participate and like be my fucking dude and not be embarrassed to me which which sounds kind of crazy but uh, um it was so sick and we like Nike put us up in the dopest hotel and and Travis was there and he was like I was like oh my god you're Travis like we were smoking a joint outside or something and he was like no man this is your night and like I remember looking over at Mark because everyone even not in snowboarding like knows who Travis Rice is and just like hanging out with him that night and like he even you know I don't know I just like I didn't know whether or not I was going to have a part in this movie. I actually thought that maybe I was like, kind of like, why are they bringing me? Like, you know, I only sent them a few shots and I ended up having like a full part in the movie. And I remember looking over at Mark and we were just like both crying, you know, um, <laughs> when that came on the screen. Cause it was like, this is a big deal. This isn't just like some bitch ass snowboard movie. Like we're in Hollywood with our name on the, <laughs> this is just, yeah, this is the ball, most ballin' hotel room we've ever stayed in. Like, it was just so sick to have him come there and and see firsthand. And I feel like as soon as he saw it, as soon as he saw what it really was, that I wasn't going there. He had a party with a bunch of, like, random dicks he doesn't know. Like, I just straight up, like, had this dream. Which was, I guess, like, be a part of it on, like have the same chance as the guys to be a part of something. And, uh, it was just really cool to have him there and, and um, and see that firsthand. And, and after that, you know, everything, he kind of like viewed everything a little differently and would help me come out and like film my stuff in the back country. He'd shuttle me, um, on all the jumps, help our crew get out there because we were all just a bunch of floundering idiots on our sleds. Um, probably to the point that he was like embarrassed to be seen with us, but never brought it up. <laughs> Someone asked me the other, oh yeah, I was, uh, met a pro skier the other day, who's a girl. And she said, man, how did you, I was telling her about filming with Mark. She was like, how did you get along with him? Because I just fight with my, like we, we butt heads so hard, me and my boyfriend. And I was like, she's like, do you guys ever, did you ever fight back there? And I was like, no, man, we, we turned it into a party. You know, we only really brought, like, we had the filmer that was our bud, and then we only brought riders that we knew were, like, down and, you know, stay in a cabin and eat mushrooms and shoot shotguns, and, you know, we turned it into a party, and it, those were, like, the best, absolute, my favorite times ever snowboarding, you know, like, I, just knowing that, normally being on a trip and just missing him so much, and then knowing that, like, I was going to land that jump or like come down from the jump and he's going to be waiting there on his sled to shuttle me back up. Um, yeah, that was the dream. How long has it been? Uh, it's, it was in 2014, July 4th, 2014. So, I mean, I guess three and a half years that will be four years this year. or Will it be five? Is it four and a half years? Three and a half right now. Yeah. I don't know. It's been a, it's been some time. And you've continued to snowboard at yeah. the level that you're at. Did it has it given you more drive taken away from it? Is it Uh the, well the first year so that was like July 4th and then the the summer came and the fall came and then it was time to snowboard again and I threw myself into it that was the year that I like didn't 
that I like least got hurt. And I think that that was like meant to be because like whatever it is, if it was him, if it was some higher thing, if it was fate or if it was just a coincidence, um, I could do anything and I would not get hurt. I think so that I could keep snowboarding. So I would just like, I filmed what I thought was the best part I had ever filmed that year. And, um, because I was just so, I didn't give a shit anymore, you know, about myself or anything. And I was just trying to like drown myself in anything. And, um, that part came out and nobody cared at all about it. Like I was like, so what that, I was kind of like, um, um, is that fair to say? Like, I think it's pretty fair. I mean, it, like I, I filmed that footage and it, it was, the way that it ended up being edited into the movie that it was in was like it got sent in and then um i think the guy had like a day or two to edit it before it had to go to post so it didn't even like they missed a bunch of shots putting them in and um and then the part came out and like i don't even know how many people even saw it because it wasn't ever like marketed that i was going to be in that movie or anything you know it just kind of went like unnoticed and That's fucked up. Yeah, but I I didn't care. Right. (laughs) Right. I was like, it's it's just that was just an observation um, Mm -hmm. that 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 it came out and that nobody cared. And I mean, I don't know if I really cared. Like, I was just it. It was one of the better, more well-rounded video parts I had ever filmed, and the it was it there was like no effort or intention put into like editing it or anything, you know? So that fucking sucks. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's on one hand it sucks. On another hand, I got to like be in a snowboard video project that I didn't even really film for. I think everyone was like backed off that year for me being like, Oh shit. Like, how's this going to go? You know, but they didn't think that I was going to come out swinging and which is like the only way that I knew how to deal with it. Um, was just to like throw myself into something. Um, and has that worked for you? Is that something that continues to work for you, or is well? Eventually, at some point, it all comes back. Like you can't escape anything, really. You can run for a long time, which I did, but eventually it comes back, um, and you realize you have to deal with it. And you realize that, or I realized that, the longer you put off dealing with something, the more like it's just never. You can never really escape from it. Um, so I've spent the past couple of years, I guess like I'd say the past year and a half or so trying to like actually process this and actually look at it and um yeah try to take what I've learned I mean I don't even know really I I well I do know I've it I realized that it like changed my perspective completely on like what life is and what is important. And I realized that what I was doing, like, I remember when, when Mark was around, he'd always be like, I'd say, I feel so guilty for being a pro snowboarder. It's such a selfish pursuit. Like you just go around being like, I'm the star, film me. Um, I get all the stuff. You guys get fuck all, like, give me some more awards, you know? And he was like, well, you got to do something to give back. And I was like, well, I don't know how to give back, but I would just kind of like mentor these girls that were up and coming, um, that I felt like like I would like seek out. I just felt like I always had like a pretty good eye on what was happening in girls snowboarding because it was the thing that I did. That was, um, you know, I cared about it. I cared about the future of it. I cared about what, what, what was going to happen once I was gone. I like what you said about Peter Lino instead of just like, taking the, or taking the guys that he thought that could beat him and putting them on the team. Um, I thought that that was like, I felt like that was like a noble thing to do was to take these girls that maybe someone else might look at. Or if I was like, uh, gonna be a, I don't know, take the easy route and, or like the shitty route and be like, Oh man, these girls are coming up on me and they could take my job. I better squish them instead like helping them and giving them the best possible chance and then like so I could deep down again know and like going overboard with it same thing I did with like farting when I was coming up (laughs) just so that I could know deeply that I never like held anyone back that I only did things to like further um further our cause and um 
So kind of one-on-one, I was like mentoring these girls and kind of sponsoring them. Um, Like I would uh, pay for their flights and bring them on my filming trips and let them kind of like tag team off my travel budget or stay in my hotel and roll in my rental car and use my filmer and and get photos and and all that stuff. And, um, And then after I... Uh, had to stop and like do some eventually like yeah I I kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing and I I mean I know I'm kind of flopping back and forth here but it'll all come together Um, eventually I had to stop and get shoulder surgery and ankle surgery and I knew that I wasn't going to be really riding this coming season or that coming season so I thought and that was also when I was like really questioning like this this thing with Mark like why did that happen you know and if it did what what good could come out of it and so I just started rethinking and really coming to terms with the fact that we're all gonna die that I'm gonna die and I'm gonna be gone and what's gonna be left what is my legacy gonna be and what did I do to contribute to stuff to the things that I cared about that were important to me when I was here instead of just being like I want all these things you know I want success in snowboarding I want opportunities in snowboarding what did I do to contribute to that? And so I realized I want to do something bigger than just like low key, try to help a couple girls out that I think are coming up. Um, I'm going to make a girl snowboard movie and it's not going to be about me. It's going to be, um, I'm just going to pick a handful of girls that I know are capable of doing it and buy a camera and hit the road. And that's what I'm going to do this season. Um, so that's how the uninvited got started. It's called the uninvited because we're, the girls are always not invited. Like, I mean, I'm talking to all these girls on the phone all the time or in person, whatever, trying to give them advice. And it always comes down to like, well, yeah, we wanted, we were ready to send it, but then like last minute, we just didn't get invited to that catalog shoot or, um, we got to go on the trip, but all the guys wouldn't let me hit any spots or all this stuff that they're just like pushed aside. And, um, man, I always think about that. I sound like that you know that blood for blood living in exile song where it's like for all those who have ever been this one goes out to all those who have ever been pushed down kicked around you know that <laughs> like that fuck I, I wish that i mean like of course that was an epic video part but i wish i could have used that as the as the intro <sighs> um but yeah i mean guys can talk all the shit they want but i'm i'm here i'm on the ground and i know that this is a real thing this is a thing that has happened to me i mean even bring this up it's happened to me on a huge level where I did all the things that were asked of me and like filmed a part that the part that I'm probably like the most proud of and um didn't find out that I actually wasn't like I was marketed to be in it everything and didn't find out that I actually wasn't in it until it premiered on Red Bull TV because I couldn't get a call back about what was going on like I just wanted to know what was what's going on what are are you guys why are you guys not getting back to me? You know, all this stuff. Um, so that had happened right before um, the surgery thing happened. So it was kind of like I came back and I was like, man, everything's really falling apart. Like I did all the things that were asked of me. I went above and beyond. And um, in terms of like, I, I shouldn't have, when the doctor finally like opened up my shoulder, it was like, holy shit, looks like you've been in a car accident. Like how you should have got this surgery like two years ago. And I was like, I know, but I... I know, but I had to film this part, this part that I felt was just like wasted on, I mean, and, and that's not, not like, like editors and whoever is going to like take my personal feelings into consideration. But when the answer to like, why was I not in that movie? The answer is 100% because I'm a girl, because I'm the girl, I'm the easiest one to cut there. I know that there were other people that were fighting to get their footage in there too. And it's just like, the girl stuff, the budgets, everything were just the first, the easiest ones to, the first ones to go if someone's going to go. And, and I, and the argument could have been made that, uh, that, that part, the footage wasn't good enough. Um, which was kind of like the reason that if I was given any reason, it might've been that reason. And so like, just for shits, I edited the part myself and put it out and it got nominated for all three awards. It won Reader's Choice Award. It was up for video part of the year and women's reader of the year like so to say that and this was a year that like a lot of girls filmed a good video parts too so it was 
like what is the reason actually well it I don't know I don't want to say it was because I'm a girl but that is it and that pissed me off on like this whole level that I was just like I'm gonna quit snowboarding do we care about the train whistle it's kind of this weird mood behind what yeah, you're I know. saying. It's we like, just need some thunder. Whoa. Um, I mean, I don't want to like call call anyone out. I'm, that's not why I'm saying this, but I'm saying like that this was what spurned the uninvited. This to be at the very top and to have done what I view as like all the right things. I never slacked. I know deep, deep, deep down that I never slacked on a goddamn thing. Every opportunity I was given, I tried to like take it and make more of it. Um, every minute that I was ever given in front of a filmer's lens, like I went, I, I did everything that I possibly could have right more than right. And still I got the same treatment as the rest of the girls. So I thought, man, what the, like first I was pissed and I was like, "I, I think I quit snowboarding. I quit, I quit everything. And then I was like, no, I'm going to do something about this and shove this up these not these guys, not that particular situation, but just like this whole thing that we're up against. Like, I'm going to shove it up their asses. They think like that girls can't film shit or girls aren't worthy to give budgets to or whatever. Like, let's just see what happens. So I just like made the uninvited and funded it myself and just used my like airline points and savings (laughs) and, and just like my travel budget where I could and just favors from friends and just pieced it all together and um okay how do people support you with this is there somewhere where they can go and they can pay to download it i mean honestly it was like i was never doing it to be like i'm gonna make the money i knew i wasn't gonna make the money back and i kind of wanted to make a point of not making the money back okay because um i don't it's not for sale i mean we don't have the like so ghetto how we did it like we don't have the music rights i don't think i could sell it anyways and I don't really want to sell it because that might stop like an extra person from seeing it. So on our tour, premiere tour, um, we sold t-shirts to like help pay for the cost of the tour. But I don't know, someone, and I will actually tell you who, it's my life hero, Marie Francois, um, told me she like did something crazy a while ago where she took all these people all the people that had like helped her in snowboarding, whatever on this, like she rented out a cat, but it was like, I don't know. She'd probably be bummed if I even said this, but it was like 25 grand or something for all these people. And I was like, Oh my God, you would do that. And she was like, yeah, I'm just doing this thing where I just like give some give ridiculously, you know? And I know it's going to come back. And I was like, man, she had the balls to give ridiculously. I'm going to have to take my $25,000 cat ride and give it ridiculously to women snowboarding. And um, so I did, and I was never... I mean, there were points where, honestly, like I had... Nike had... The Nike thing had ended because they they pulled out of snowboarding. And that was my biggest sponsor. And I had talked with a couple other companies, but just didn't feel right about it and was just kind of like, wow, my career is kind of actually like, I still know that I've got the juice to like do the shredding, but I think this is kind of ending. And not only that, I like am taking the money that I had saved up and kind of like spending it. Like I, um, but I, and like, I didn't even want to tell people that, like, I didn't even give the impression to anyone that, that we didn't have sponsors for the movie really, because I felt like people would try to talk me out of it, but I just knew that it was the right thing to do. And, um, like I I had this dream that I wanted to ride for the North face. Cause I'm like this outdoor motherfucker, you know, want to do everything outside. And, and I just was, you know, I know I can't ride for Patagonia cause I'm like really like burning gas. <laughs> You know, they're not going to want someone like dirt biking up a hill with a chainsaw on their back being like, save the planet and not saying that North Face doesn't want that either. But I hit them up this past year being like, I'm just talking about things coming around that you're like, and who knows, maybe it has nothing to to do with the uninvited thing. But um, I hit them up saying, hey, 
you know what? Like in my head, I was like, if I'm not going to have a sponsor anyways, then I just want to like ride the shit that I would just buy. And I actually went like right before we went for our filming trip for the uninvited, I went and bought a North Face down jacket because I was like, this thing's dope. I don't have a sponsor anyway. I can wear whatever I want. I hit them up last year and I said, hey, um, will you send me a pair of pants and a jacket and just give me a chance to like prove myself. Maybe I can like next year and get two pairs of pants and two jackets. And they were like, uh, there was like silence for a while. And I was like, oh yeah, used to that. And then they hit me up being like, hey, we actually want to sign you to our team. And I was like, you're fucking kidding me. You got to be kidding me. And, and then they like took me to bald face and like, got to eat steak dinner and ride up in a helicopter and I was just tripping out like and I'm not saying like I I did any of this stuff to have these good things happen to me but I, I realized that since I blindly started giving and not just giving of my money but giving of my time my effort um and anything that I had to give these kind of like miracle things have been happening to me and I never did them for those things but I'm just saying like to people out there don't necessarily be afraid to like give ridiculously of yourself not it it doesn't have to be money but just like you know do something help someone out that you're actually scared is going to come up and take your job you know um something good might come out of it and if nothing does then you die when you die you know Like, you know, I I spent a lot of time thinking about, like, Mark's last moments or whatever. And and then I thought about what are my last moments going to be like? Am I going to look back and kind of have this sinking feeling of guilt that I, you know, kind of stepped on other people to get to the top and, and kind of, you know, acted selfishly when, when I didn't have to. And, and I, I don't want to have any of those feelings. And I, and I, I mean, honestly, I don't think, besides the fact that guilt that I had of, like, being a pro snowboarder where everyone has to work these, like, shitty nine to five jobs and I, like, am living the life, um, I don't think that I would have, like, had those regrets when I died, but I just wanted to, like, make triple sure. So right now, like, if you can, you can shoot me right now <laughs> and I'm good. Like, I don't. I'm not saying like, wow, I'm a great person, but I just like know personally that, that, um, that I did the right thing or I've done the right things, at least for my conscience and like how I would have looked to, you know, that, that same way that I looked to Marie who always, when I was like the biggest kook coming up, biggest fan of hers, hitting her up on snowboard.com being like, you're my favorite. I love you. (laughs) My, my dorky ass video is premiering in Whistler this week. And she showed up, she showed up. Not only that, she came to my house party after. And I was like, you know, I always want to give people the time of day. And I never like, I don't know. I tell that, I tell that to the girls too, because I'm always like giving them advice and stuff and just like, it was cool taking them on this premiere tour because for the first time they had been, they were doing poster signings. They were being asked for their autograph. Everyone wanted to get photos with them. And sometimes they would just kind of be drunk and like fuck off and not show up on time or whatever. And I'd be like, you guys look, this is important because this, you know, like you might look at this, at this meet and greet thing and only like three girls show up to it. But to those three girls, they're going to remember this moment forever. And you have a chance to make a good impression on them or you have a chance to make them feel like they're not important and that they should just fuck off and they're not a part of this. And, um, you were one of those girls once that could have, could have felt either way. And I, you know, even like what me letting them be a part of this project, like made them not feel like that. And, the result was like this incredible opportunity for them to like have all their dreams come true instead of just feeling like they should just like fuck off, you know? So no, I'm not saying like they, they ended up doing like a great job. Um, but I think it's just like, there's a lot of stuff about being a pro snowboarder. I just want to be like the best at it, not better than anyone else, the best, but the best at like every little aspect of it. I want to fucking kill it. I want to show up early and start cooking hot dogs at the hot dog sales. Like I want to start, yeah, because then no one can say after, and I, I know I shouldn't just be hung up on this forever, but no one can say after, like, girls aren't worth investing in. They just, 
come and they take and they go and they give nothing back. It's like, no, I don't know. You fucking murdered this interview. Murdered it. <laughs> I can't believe it. I've never done an interview that I've been as fucking wrapped watching somebody talk. And I'm saying this as a preamble for what I'm about to say, which is Peter Line bringing up the people he's jealous of. I want to say it on mic and I, hopefully I can put this out on the on the show. Like, you would be so much better at this than I am. You should do a podcast for fucking sure. I, I want to give you the gear so you can interview whoever the hell you want. Whenever the All hell right, you want. All right, I'm down. That would be so dope. I know that people would listen to it like a million percent. Thank you for giving me the access to the genuine you. You know what I mean? Like you were talking about when I called you on the way up. Like, please don't ask me. So why did you why did you start snowboarding? It was like, almost like please don't ask me about snowboarding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not and, that like I don't want to talk about it, but I think that snowboarding is the snowboarding is just the result. It's just like the the vehicle that I'm using to express um, who I am, and um, you're doing an incredible job of it. Thanks. That's awesome. Okay, I'm turning this off. Right. F and Rad shoutouts this week to Ben Belock, who's Jess's roommate and filmer, and also an incredibly talented snowboarder, and hopefully future guest of the show. I want to thank Matt Turner from Beaver Wax. Beaver Wax makes some epic products. Go to beaverwax.com and check them out. They give us a bunch of wax to give out at our premiere, so that's why I'm thanking them. Tribute Board Shop sent me a Patagonia Micro Puff mid layer this week. I, it's awesome thanks to shane mark and buff at tribute those guys are awesome buy some stuff from tribute board shop also for the listeners of the show tribute's given me some hoodies and some hats to give out could have come up with a contest to decide who gets that stuff i haven't forgot about the decline backpacks that they've given me to give out to you guys gonna start giving those away in december i'm gonna have the waffle for a custom-built wired snowboard the last week of November, so next week. So watch the Waffle House of Snowboarding Facebook group, please. And I'm just going to talk real quick about the Dekine pants I got from Brian at Dekine, the Stoker 3L Gore-Tex pant. They got every bell and whistle that you could get in the pant. I'm excited to use them. It hasn't snowed here yet. But as soon as it does, you know I'm going to go. Hopefully it'll snow this week. We need to get these mountains open for fucking sure. Thanks to Grouse Mountain for supporting the show. Come back next week for another episode of the Effenrad Snowboarding Podcast brought to you by SIA Productions.